Uh, okay. So next up, our next speaker is the CEO and co-founder of Euroloop. It's a, Euroloop is a company working on bringing the Hyperloop, or the vacuum train, concept to reality. Uh, before starting it, Marek was uh, the controls lead of R-Loop, a non-profit organization which won one of the five main awards for the most innovative Hyperloop capsule at Elon Musk's SpaceX Hyperloop pod competition. Marek was controls and mechanical engineer at CERN for five years, where he worked on Nobel Prize awarded experiment called ATLAS, uh, which is a part of the Large Hadron Collider. Outside of Euroloop, Marek plays basketball and is a passionate language learner. Please welcome on stage Mr. Marek Gutmostove. Is the microphone working? Can you hear me well? Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, my name is Marek, as you already know. Today I'm going to be talking about what we do at Euroloop and what is Hyperloop for cargo. So basically, first of all, first things first, what is Hyperloop at all? Most of you probably know it is a concept of moving passengers, mostly, between big cities at very high velocities. It consists of a big tube, which is evacuated, meaning there's no air inside, and there are capsules which move passengers, or as you will learn soon, cargo. Why would you even work on that? What's the main reason? Basically everything is included in this graph. Uh, this is a graph which shows the total resistance uh, for the intermodal train moving intermodal containers, and uh, what is the source of the resistance as you increase the speed. You can basically see that the rolling resistance and the bearing resistance in green and blue remains at a relatively low level even if you go beyond 100 kilometers per hour, whereas the air resistance grows very, very fast. In fact, at around 60 kilometers per hour, it is the main source of your power losses. It grows to the power of two, the air resistance, uh, with speed and uh, the power needed to overcome that air resistance uh, grows to the power of three. So it grows really, really rapidly. Uh, so if you want to make a sustainable mode of transportation, you really need to get rid, get rid of air. So you all probably heard that Elon Musk, the founder of Tesla, SpaceX, and PayPal, has been working on that for a while. In fact, he released in 2013 a white paper which outlined the technology. However, he wasn't the one to invent it. In fact, already in the 19th, late 19th century, we had a walkable uh, prototype of a Hyperloop. It was a pneumatic metro system, or shall I call it a subway, because it was in New York, where people could onboard and by the means of a few pumps, uh, you could push the carriage with the people uh, on a two kilometer long stretch, uh, and it was in fact operational for about two years. Uh, the exact reasons of closing it uh, are unknown, uh, however that was in fact the first prototype of a Hyperloop more than 100 years ago. Uh, back in the days when Elon released the white paper, I was an engineer at CERN, I was working on ATLAS, uh, which is a Nobel awarded uh, physics experiment, which is a part of the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, it is a, a big accelerator which smashes protons together um, and in many ways it resembles what the Hyperloop is about to be. It is a basically a big evacuated tube where you accelerate things together, the only difference is you don't smash them. The other difference is <laughs> you don't have the very extremities of physics in Hyperloop which you have to have in LHC to make your physics experiments. So I knew that from the physics perspective, it's going to work. Although being an engineer on a, on a daily basis, I knew that sometimes it isn't about the physics, it is about what's on the market, what's available, what's off the shelf components you can buy to make your product in the long term profitable. I decided to find out, I joined an international team called Arloop, uh, we basically got it on Reddit, some of you might know it, and we decided to take part in Elon's competition, which, we, uh, which he announced shortly after announcing the whole idea of Hyperloop. Uh, after almost two years of work, uh, we managed to get to the big final. We were chosen as one of the 30 teams uh, that made it out of the initial pool of, I think, 1,200. 
so there were people from all around the world taking part in it, and in the final run, we managed to win one of the five main awards, which was the award for the most innovative capsule, uh, which you can see in this picture. So what you see here is basically the first scalable Hyperloop capsule ever presented to the public. Um, it consisted basically of every single subsystem that should be in the final Hyperloop capsule. So it had the pressure vessel, we were the only one to present it. It had the levitation system, it had a cooling system, uh, and many more. Uh, and that's why, in fact, we won the Innovation Award, because we basically managed to put it all together and uh, make it work. After the competition, uh, we decided that we basically have enough information about the whole Hyperloop ecosystem that we can start the company. Uh, we were basically we asked ourselves a question, what would be a good place to do that? Well, the US is not so good because the public transportation is basically non-existent there. Uh, European countries are good, but most of them already have high-speed railway. So uh, our attention was basically forwarded to Poland. Uh, it is a big transportation hub, only second to Germany in Europe, and there's funding available for innovative projects. So we decided to give it a try and we established a company here. Since uh, the uh, introduction of, of, of Euroloop, establishment of Euroloop, uh, we established many meaningful collaborations uh, uh, which are needed to basically bring the system to the market. It is, uh, I would say almost an overwhelming task, so you need a lot of people, a lot of institutions have to come together to make it work. Uh, we have academia partners, we have uh, basically business partners, uh, government partners, uh, all those people uh, and companies and entities are needed to make it work. Just to give you an example, the Institute of Railway, for instance, is one of the institutions that might certify the technology in the future. Uh, cities like Yavorsna, for instance, who gave us uh, land for the test track, and then obviously you need someone to pay for it all, so you've got customers in the intermodal uh, logistics market. Uh, a part of our team, we were basically the people who took part in the competition. Uh, with time, we got more people coming from other teams who also took part in the competition. And um, something which makes me very happy, we've got some people already from the traditional industries, like the rolling stock industry. Uh, and that person, for instance, is Bartosz Piotrowski, who is the main uh, um, industrial design uh, lead at PESA and he's personally responsible for bringing to the market more than 20 unique kind of trains. Uh, and definitely experience like that is very needed, either from the railway industry or from the aviation uh, industry. We also have very one interesting person, Richard McFarlane, uh, who's a retired Australian engineer. Uh, he was the person who got to the, um, uh, well, uh, to the competition, he got to the finals, he could then advance to the big final, uh, but he was in the semi-final uh, as a one-person team. He basically put together the proposal that took us probably 50 people working together, 200 pages of text, he put it all together, and he was working on the full-scale Hyperloop. After the competition, he joined us, and some of the ideas that are in our system are actually his to begin with. So, uh, because we want to commercialize it, well, what is the exact problem that we're trying to solve. Uh, because we are no longer moving passengers in the first implementations, uh, there are two things that we want to solve in the logistic networks. First of all, is the high operational expenses, and the second one is the congestion. Uh, in particular, we are focusing on a very niche market, uh, which in fact is very big, uh, but it's a niche. Uh, basically, uh, intermodal um, uh, cargo terminals. So the places when they move the uh, containers, uh, it's been growing the market, the movement in those uh, terminals at a steady rate, three to five percent worldwide, ten to fifteen percent in highly developing countries like Poland, for instance. Um, and the problem that they have is the fact that the ships they grew to ridiculous sizes. They can carry up to 21,000 containers, and basically what you have on land, the infrastructure, cannot keep up with the demand to move them outside, to dispatch them as soon as possible. So what you have is these uh, big storage areas that occupy, uh, occupy very precious land uh, next to the, re uh, to the sea banks. Why this problem exists? Because there's no simple solution to that which will have enough throughput uh, due to the increased velocity, at the same time it will have relatively low capex and preferably lower opex, so the operational expenses, as compared um, to the other means of transportation. Uh, 
why Hyperloop, the way we specified it, we believe why, why would have that throughput, uh, why at the time being relatively cheap? Well, basically, um, we combine a few very simple technologies. We got rid of the magnetic levitation, which we uh, did for the competition and figured that we, we cannot really introduce that to the market. It's way too expensive and we don't really need it. So what we're going to do, we're actually going to use wheels and we'll do something called free banking. Free banking is nothing different than what planes do when they attack a curve. So they, they, they come into the curve, they start rolling, and they come at an angle, uh, which means that forces acting on the passengers are lower than they would be if you were just playing straight. Um, and with a tube surface, you can do that a lot. You can basically go like a plane, you, you, you bank at 45 degrees angle, and you can uh, go through the curve way, way faster which means that not exceeding very high velocities, uh, let's say of 300 kilometers per hour, you can use the existing rights of way, which is super important, something that people forget when thinking about the Hyperloop. It is not the technology which is in the Hyperloop which, is, which makes linear infrastructure expensive. It is the demolition of houses, of neighborhoods, all that, com that comes with straight lines of linear infrastructure. So we are actually getting rid of that component. At the same time, it resembles in many ways a, a truck. It is basically a capsule that takes one container, 40 feet long, on two, 20 feet long, and you can have on-demand scheduling. Uh, as soon as you have a container ready to dispatch, you basically dispatch it. So what do you start with? You start with a cargo terminal, also something very important because you are in low pressure. You need an access to your capsule without depressurizing the whole system. So if you combine a few solutions known on the market from the Antonov plane, from the International Space Station, you can actually do that. And that's the very, very first concept that we had of that in a very long while. Basically, the capsule arrives, uh, the nose goes up, you have two-door system, and then uh, you join uh, with the airlock. In the end, what we plan to do uh, is basically to have a big conveyor belt that will be taking all of the containers, pushing them straight through the airlock and then dispatching them into the so-called dry puts. What we do with Hyperloop is we broke it down into a three-stage phase development. First of all, we have a one-kilometer stretch uh, with our partners when we will be moving empty containers uh, between the terminal and, and between the container depot which refurbishes the containers. And later on, we plan to connect a contain a terminal with a dry pod, which is a logistics center within uh, the hinterland uh, from where you actually dispatch the containers further. Typically, these uh, dry pods are more or less 30 kilometers away um, from the uh, standard uh, container terminal. So uh, that's pretty much what, uh, more or less what it's going to look like. So we've got uh, two tubes coming straight into the terminal. Uh, then you ha might have multiple airlocks. They're going to all be picking up uh, the containers uh, in real time uh, because our throughput is enough for them to actually do that. Uh, you could also potentially apply this solution uh, to the bulk cargo transportation. If you, wherever you have two factories, uh, a power plant, a mine, and you need to move large quantities of goods between them, uh, be it you know, a, a copper ore, uh, or coal, right? So you can move them using Hyperloop. And what's the advantage to that? Basically, uh, a conveyor belt, for instance, has thousands, if not millions, of moving elements. All these elements are, uh, are, 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 can be, uh, uh, they have to withstand the weather, uh, they have to withstand the humidity, uh, the rain, and so on. So they, they tend to go broke uh, quite often. Um, this is the result of our work already as a Euroloop. Uh, so together with Bartosz from PESA, we basically designed the first uh, Hyperloop capsule for intermodal containers. So it doesn't look big here, uh, but it's quite big, but keep in mind that actually it's still uh, slightly um, smaller than a standard railway carriage. So while working on that, we ask ourselves a question. So if we have that space of a container, what would happen if we actually fit that uh, with the room for the passengers, right? So we did a study um, together with the Academy of Fine Arts uh, in Warsaw, where students actually designed a couple of interiors uh, for the Hyperloop based on the container uh, carrier. 
Uh, and it turned out, first of all, uh, that it's not that much space, as it might seem. The containers, they seem relatively big, but when you try to actually put all that stuff together, uh, it's not that big. Um, and this is basically the result of it. So th that's the interior of a capsule uh, that beforehand was used to move the containers. You can have two very comfortable rows uh, of seats or an additional, a third one, uh, and that's basically the space that you're looking at. If you were to make anything smaller, that would be very, very claustrophobic. So we do believe that starting with the containers is not only a good way to introduce Hyperloop to the market, it's actually the requirement for later passenger networks that might be constructed in the future. And uh, he also in red to match our calls. So where we are with uh, Euroloop? Well, we basically uh, started the company at the beginning of 2017. We kicked it off. We established a couple of uh, co collaborations, very meaningful. Um, uh, we uh, signed multiple letters of, in of interest with uh, different parties. And very, very important, we started the collaboration back then with the Ministry of uh, Development, right now the Ministry of Entrepreneurship and Technology, uh, which is working on setting up a path how to certify technology, how to prepare it for certification process, what norms and standards are going to be needed. Like the technological part of the problem is, I would say, probably 50%, another 50% is actual, actually the legislation. Uh, as some people say, no legislation is worse than bad legislation. In our case, there's no legislation. So we have to work on that. I'm very happy uh, to say that this process is undergoing. Uh, another thing, uh, our government is working on the uh, central communication port, a very old idea, probably like 20 years old. Uh, that's where the first studies were done on that. And as part of the document, um, that they all agreed on, uh, there's going to be space left for a low pressure railway terminal. So in case we're going to have a massive airport in the center of the country within 10 years, uh, well, and if there is a new technology ready to serve the passengers, it's going to be there, the room is going to be uh, reserved. So um, once again, uh, we starting with the container terminals, uh, that's us investing in one of the partners, uh, basically. Later on, we have a massive potential in Poland, uh, and I will repeat it, massive, colossal, uh, of moving the goods from China, uh, in particular from Chengdu. Uh, we have signed letter of intent uh, with a company, which, is, uh, which was the first company to move the, uh, the direct railway um, route uh, between Chengdu and Wuch, and they are moving uh, more than uh, 300 trains per year right now, um, on this route, uh, and we can all dispatch those containers either from Wuch um, and, and potentially in the future we could even connect the container terminals uh, with the city of Wuch. So if I were to say what would be the first long distance track of Hyperloop in Poland, I would say it's going to be between Gdańsk and Wuch. Uh, but only time uh, will tell. Uh, and the, the last but not least, uh, the certification path. Um, currently, we are in the final stage of the verification of the, of the project, which will start the work on that. Uh, and there's many partners involved in it, multiple universities. Uh, in total, there's going to be around 150 people working on that. Uh, and in fact, we are not alone. Also in the European Union, uh, the, the agencies are also looking into Hyperloop and thinking about what we have to do before we actually have the technology ready, uh, because that's also a massive task. So that's going to be all, all. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thanks. Don't go anywhere. Don't go, Don't go anywhere. anywhere. Okay, I'm Just not. Hold stay off. right there. Staying. Do you like the socks? <laughs> it's what you can win. Okay, this is what you can win. So questions for you, Mark. Is is the new Silk Road a potential area for investment? Oh yeah, absolutely. So as I said, we already signed one letter of intent with uh, a company which is moving the goods uh, on the new Silk Road, the so-called North Silk Road, but also we are in the process of uh, uh, investigating a second uh, place in Poland where we could apply that. Okay, thank you. And when and where can we expect the first operational cargo yeah. route? Oh yeah, so definitely it's going to be a route connecting one of the, one of the container terminals. That's my best guess about it. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that an educational guess? Uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I did 
did some research on that. <laughs> <laughs> Good. All right, All right, please, round of applause for Merrick. Thank you so much.